Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're revisiting, kind of re-reviewing I suppose, the Ryzen 7 1700, which I'd say is probably the most important CPU AMD's ever released. The Ryzen 7 range was a pretty big deal back in early 2017 as it doubled the core count for mainstream desktop CPUs from 4 to 8. At the time, if you wanted a new 8-core 16-thread desktop CPU, you were faced with having to pay over $1,000 US for Intel's Core i7-6900K, which was a high-end desktop part. And then the mainstream flagship option of the time was the $340 US Core i7-7700K. The Ryzen 7 range, on the other hand, started at $330 US for the Ryzen 7 1700, then $400 for the 1700X, and $500 for the 1800X, though it is worth noting that the X parts were quickly discounted to improve their competitiveness. On paper, the R7 1700 looked very impressive. Not only were you getting 8 cores and 16 threads that clocked up to 3.7 GHz, but the chip also packed a 16 MB L3 cache, which was a huge deal at the time. Basically, AMD was able to offer 8 cores for slightly less than Intel's flagship quad-core processor at the time, and as a result, the Ryzen 7 processors dominated productivity and content creation benchmarks. Game benchmarks, on the other hand, while not bad, were a bit of a letdown, and it's here where Intel still enjoyed a strong performance advantage. That said, even in my day one review, I did notice that while slower in terms of FPS performance, the Ryzen 7 processors enabled an incredibly smooth gaming experience. Noting that titles such as Grand Theft Auto 5 and Battlefield 1 were noticeably smoother, and looking back on the results, we did see a very tight grouping between the average and minimum frame rate. So, while not at the same level as Intel, the gaming performance was still very acceptable and I expected that we'd actually see the R7 1700 overtake the 7700K in 3-4 to four years time thanks to its many more cores. Since then we've seen AMD continue to increase the core count of mainstream desktop CPUs while also radically improving the performance and efficiency of their Zen architecture. So, given that I'd spent a lot of time recently benchmarking and testing the latest and greatest AMD and Intel processors, I thought it might be interesting to take a look back at the Ryzen 7 1700 and add it to our new data set. So, I've gone back and done exactly that, and of course we also have the Core i7 7700K along for comparison. This in a way will be a bit of a re-review of the Ryzen 7 1700 three years later, so it should be pretty interesting. For testing the Ryzen processors, the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master was used, while the 8th and 9th gen Intel processors were tested on the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Ultra, and the new 10th gen Intel Core processors on the ASUS ROG Maximus 12 Extreme. Finally, all configurations were tested with the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, 32 gigabytes of DDR4-3200CL14 memory, and a Corsair Hydro Series H150i Pro 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's get into the results. Starting with Cinebench R20, we find that the Ryzen 7 1700 is on par with the Core i5-10400, Intel's latest 6-core 12-thread processor, and that meant it was 37% faster than the 7700K. I was able to overclock the 1700 for a 21% performance uplift, but I won't focus too much on the OC results for this content as I haven't overclocked the 7700K. This wasn't meant to be an overclocking comparison, I'm just providing the data because I happen to have it. Still, it is interesting to note that with a typical overclock, the R7 1700 is a little faster than the stock Ryzen 5 3600 and slightly slower than the Ryzen 7 2700X. Here we can see one of the bigger weaknesses of the original Zen architecture, and that is, of course, single core performance. The R7 1700 scores just 332 points, and that means it's almost 30% slower than the 7700K. And while the overclock did reduce that deficit to 15%, that is still quite a sizable margin. But getting back to the stock results, we see that the 2700X is almost 30% faster in this test, while Zen 2 parts, like the 3700X, are over 50% faster. The 7-zip performance hasn't changed too much since release. The Ryzen 7 1700 is still very dominant here when compared to competing parts. We're again looking at almost a 40% performance boost over the 7700K when comparing stock performance. And something we discovered early on was how efficient AMD's SMT technology was when handling decompression work. Here the R7 1700 is over 60% faster than the 7700K, and in fact it's even able to beat the new Core i5-10600K. 
Here's a test that we didn't run a little over three years ago now when we first reviewed the Ryzen 7 processors. And here we're seeing very impressive AES 256-bit performance, crushing the 7700K by a 65% margin. Moving on, the Ryzen 7 1700, like all Ryzen processors, excels when it comes to rendering type workloads, and here we're again seeing over a 40% performance boost when compared to the Core i7 7700K. This meant it was slightly faster than the new Core i5 10400, and slightly slower than the 10600K. We're also seeing strong performance gains over the 7700K in the V-Ray benchmark. This time the first gen Ryzen processor was 38% faster, and that again placed it between the new Core i5-10400 and Core i5-10600K. And for the final rendering related benchmark, we have the Corona benchmark. And as you can see, the R7 1700 is again roughly 40% faster than the 7700K when it comes to rendering tasks. So that data is pretty unanimous at this point. Here's another benchmark that we didn't include back in 2017, and it's one that many of you have requested. So we went and added it to the long list of applications and games that we already test with. The code compilation performance of the Ryzen 7 1700 is very impressive, and although not quite as strong as what we saw in the rendering benchmarks, it is still 30% faster than the 7700K, and that's obviously a very significant performance advantage. That said, we are seeing a further 35% performance boost with the 2700X and then an additional 16% with the 3700X. This is an interesting test. Back when the first gen Ryzen 7 series was released, it was only slightly faster than the 7700K for video production work. Here though, we're seeing a 16% improvement in the Puget Systems DaVinci Resolve Studio benchmark. And in fact, the R7 1700 is basically on par with the Core i5-10600K. So quite an impressive result. And even bigger performance gains can be seen in the Adobe Premiere Pro benchmark. Here the R7 1700 was 26% faster than the 7700K as it was able to match the Core i5-10600K. So a very strong result here and it's great to see the improvements these video editing applications have made over the past three years, allowing them to better utilize processes with more than four cores. That said, not all applications can or have been optimized to take advantage of higher core count CPUs, at least not to the degree seen with the video production software. Adobe Photoshop, for example, mirrors what we see in the Cinebench R20 single core test, and that's not great news for the Ryzen 7 1700, as it was 13% slower than the 7700K. Adobe After Effects is another application like Photoshop that relies heavily on single core performance. And as a result, the Ryzen 7 1700 again comes in well behind the 7700K, though the overclock got it up to the stock 7700K level of performance. Here's a look at total system consumption. And despite using Global Foundry's 14 nanometer process, the first gen Ryzen parts were still very power efficient. The Ryzen 7 1700, for example, can be seen consuming roughly the same level of power as the 7700K, which is extremely impressive given it delivered over 40% greater performance. Okay, time for a few game related benchmarks. And first up we have Battlefield 5. And I have to say, the margins here look quite similar to what was found three years ago using Battlefield 1. The Core i7 7700K offers better average frame rate performance, but the R7 1700 is slightly better when comparing 1% lows. And we see less of a margin between the 1% low and average frame rate with the Ryzen processor. And we see similar behavior at 1440p, though here the stricter GPU limits see the R7 1700 trail the 7700K by just a 7% margin. By the way, remember we are using a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti for all of this testing. The problem for Ryzen when it comes to gaming has always been games like Far Cry New Dawn that are influenced heavily by cache and memory latency. Here the 7700K was up to 28% faster, which is a massive margin and a very noticeable performance improvement when talking about 86 FPS versus 110 FPS. The game experience is still smooth with the Ryzen processor, but it's far from ideal for those using high refresh rate monitors. Even at 1440p, the R7 1700 looks rather slow, though the overclock does help out here, getting it within range of the 2700X. But even at 1440p, we're talking about a 32% performance advantage going the way of the 7700K, and that margin was only reduced to 14% when overclocking the Ryzen 7 processor, and of course you can also overclock the Core i7 processor if you wish to. Even in newer titles like Gears Tactics, the Ryzen 7 1700 struggles. Here the 7700K was almost 40% faster, and that is a truly massive margin. 
Granted, we're using an extreme graphics card, but this does highlight just how far AMD's come with the Zen architecture in the last three years, and we are expecting another big step soon. Increasing the resolution to 1440p does drastically reduce the margins, and now the 7700K is only 20% faster, though admittedly only is probably the wrong word to use here, as that is still quite a large margin. However, there are a number of modern games that aren't particularly CPU intensive or sensitive, such as Ghost Recon Breakpoint. And here the margin between the Ryzen 7 1700 and Core i7 7700K is relatively small. Moreover, when testing under more realistic conditions, there's almost no margin to speak of. Here the 7700K was just 3% faster than the R7 1700 when testing at 1440p. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a CPU intensive title and the open world section we use for testing really helps highlight this. The R7 1700 matched the 7700K when comparing the average frame rate, but managed to boost the 1% low performance by 7% and once overclocked we found very strong performance relative to the more modern processors. Similar margins are seen at 1440p and despite the increased GPU bottleneck, the R7 1700 is noticeably better than the 7700K when comparing the 1% low data. And finally, we have Red Dead Redemption 2. This is another new title that is quite CPU demanding, and here we see the Ryzen 7 1700 making out rather well, roughly matching the Ryzen 5 3600 and Core i5-9600K, making it slightly faster than the 7700K. Jumping up to 1440p does hurt the R7 1700's ranking, but despite a very small drop off in average frame rate performance, the 1% low results remain on par with the likes of the 7700K and 2700X. Now, because this isn't a gaming focused content piece, we only have half a dozen titles, but I think the data gives us a pretty clear picture of how the 7700K and 1700 compare in 2020. As we just saw, for the most part, games still run perfectly fine on a four core, eight thread processor, and therefore the 7700K performs very well thanks to its high operating clock frequency and low latency design. On average, the Intel processor was 15% faster when comparing the average frame rate and 5% faster for the 1% lows. Overclocked, the R7 1700 mimics how the Ryzen 7 1800X performs, and that being the case, we're looking at roughly a 6% performance uplift from the 1800X to the 2700X, and then 7% from the 2700X to the 3700X. Something I found quite amazing was just how similar the first gen Ryzen 7 results seen here are to that of my 16 game benchmark three years ago. Back then I benchmarked the 1700X and 1800X in 16 games against a range of Intel processors, including the 7700K, and quite remarkably, the 1800X averaged 111 FPS with 88 FPS for the 1% low. Today, the overclocked 1700 averaged 110 FPS with 88 FPS for the 1% low, using a completely different range of games. This is just a pure coincidence. So when comparing that data with the 7700K, we discover some interesting margins. Looking at the three-year-old data, I found that the 7700K was 18% faster than the 1800X for the average frame rate and 23% faster for the 1% low. So compare those numbers to the overclock results for the 1700 that we saw in this video, the 7700K was just 6% faster for the average frame rate with identical 1% low performance. So I think it's pretty fair to say we have some very clear evidence that games are unsurprisingly becoming more demanding. That said, we're still not at a point where you require eight core 16 thread processors. And as I've said a number of times recently, the sweet spot right now appears to be six cores, 12 threads with a modern processor, such as the Ryzen 5 3600, or I suppose for gaming, more ideally the Core i5 10600K. Still, while I'd say 12 threads is the sweet spot in terms of price to performance, eight threads will still get you by quite comfortably and we're seeing that with the 7700K and then more recently with the Ryzen 3 3300X. Here's a look at the average frame rate margins seen on a per game basis. The only title where the stock 1700 pulled ahead was Red Dead Redemption 2, while we saw virtually identical average frame rates in Shut Off the Tomb Raider. Then we see there's titles such as Far Cry New Dawn and Gears Tactics where the first gen Ryzen 7 processor really struggles against Intel's quad core. The R7 1700 does fare much better when comparing 1% low data though. Here the Ryzen processor was faster in Shut of the Tomb Raider and Red Dead Redemption 2, while we see identical results in Battlefield 5. Again, it's Far Cry New Dawn and Gears Tactics where the Ryzen 7 processor really struggles. 
And finally, here's a breakdown of the application performance. For the most part, the Ryzen 7 processor is much faster, often offering up around a 40% performance improvement, which is huge. Then in the rare instances where it was actually slower, the margins are much smaller. The only big loss can be seen when measuring single core performance with Cinebench R20, which isn't a real world test as this application, Maxon Cinema 4D, isn't limited to single core operation. So this is purely a for science type test. Of course, in applications that do only use a single core, the Ryzen 7 1700 could be up to 28% slower, but for the most part, we're talking about tasks that take mere seconds to complete. The first generation of Ryzen processors clearly had some weaknesses, but they were often offset by their strengths, strengths such as high core counts and lower prices, and they're two things that have helped them become wise investments over time, particularly if you're looking at using your computer for tasks other than just gaming. The Core i7-7700K is still a very capable processor today, at least for gaming, but it was quickly proven to be a rather horrible buy, let's say, in the same year of its release. And that wasn't because of any Ryzen processor, but rather Intel's own need to quickly increase core counts. Forced to counter Ryzen, Intel rushed out their 8th gen core series with a new flagship part, the Core i7-8700K. And unfortunately for 7700K owners, the new 6-core 12-thread processor landed for roughly the same price, but on a new and incompatible platform, essentially killing off the flagship quad-core part inside of a 12-month period. So if you bought a 7700K in favor of the R7 1700, you are faced with having to invest in a brand new motherboard if you wish to step up to a six or eight core processor. And chances are you would have already spent well over $100 US on a Z series board. On the other hand, three years later, Ryzen 7 1700 owners now have access to a range of third gen Ryzen processors. And as an example, even the Ryzen 7 3700X presents as a reasonable upgrade especially if you wish to boost gaming performance. Alternatively, assuming that you're yet to make any upgrades and therefore still have the processor purchased three years ago in 2017, we're now at a point where the latest and greatest games are slowly starting to favor the R7 1700, while most modern applications can now take full advantage of eight core 16 thread processors. In another two or three years, we might be at a point in time where the 7700K and 1700 comparison looks a lot like the 7600K and 1600 comparison that we see today. But as I said back in 2017, if you're strictly gaming, then the Core i7 7700K is the better buy and arguably still is in 2020. But we are starting to see a shift in the data. Speaking of the data, as we move closer to a fourth generation of Ryzen processors, I feel it's been very interesting to look back at where it all began. When concluding my first ever Ryzen review, I said the following, I'm personally very excited to see AMD delivering a competitive high-end CPU, and it shall be very interesting to see how well they can refine the Zen architecture over the coming years. We know Intel has hit a development wall, so this might afford AMD the chance to catch up even further. And catch up further, they have. Third gen Ryzen was a big step forward and Threadripper took things to a whole new level. It seemed pretty clear that AMD was heading in the right direction three years ago, but I think it's fair to say few could or would have guessed just how things have turned out in a relatively short time frame. And of course, AMD's success has been good news for everyone. Well, perhaps not Intel, though the pressure to finally innovate might prove beneficial down the track. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. Hope you guys enjoyed the revisit of AMD's Ryzen 7 1700. I know I found the results quite interesting, so hopefully that was the case for you guys as well. Uh, if you like the video, you know what to do. You can subscribe for more content as well. Also, if you would like to support the work we do at Hiram Box, become more involved with the channel, then we have our Patreon account. The link for that will be in the video description. Pretty cool perks over there. Monthly live stream that'll be coming up later this month. Uh, Q&As, behind the scenes videos. We have an exclusive Discord chat for Patreon members only. So that's a really awesome community there. Great place to talk about tech related stuff and a few other things. But yeah, if you're interested, you can check that link in the video description, as I said. But other than that, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.